I'm currently working on a master model video which I'm expecting to release in the next few weeks. Before the actual video, I think it would be a good idea to go through a simple master model exercise in order to get ourselves acquainted with the mechanics of the workflow. If you would like to know more about the philosophy and benefits of the master model or top-down design approach, I will provide a link to a previous video. In this video, we will focus on understanding and managing both the browser and the timeline. This is the main challenge in employing the master model workflow. In that respect, I will be speeding through most of the sketch creation and feature creation processes. We will be creating a simple box with two halves. The basic premise of the master model approach is this. You start with the basic overall shape of the assembly, split the main body into two, and convert these two bodies into components. We can then add in details at the component level. In most cases, when you start a model in Fusion, it is always a good practice to start off with a new component. In the case of a master model workflow, we will actually create a master model at the top level. The master model in this case will be the overall shape of the assembled box. So unhide the top level primary planes and start sketching. The first rule of the master model approach is this. Any feature that is shared across the components of the assembly should be done at the top level. The overall shape and the main fillets are definitely shared features, and so is the shell thickness, since we expect the two halves of the box to share the same overall thickness. With the shared features done, it is time to split the box. The split line in this case would also be considered a shared feature, since the two halves of the box would mate perfectly along that split line. Create a split line. And use the split body command to split the box into two halves. Let's rename the bodies. Control select both of them and go to create components from bodies. At this point, the top level has become a sub assembly. Also, notice that the bodies folder no longer exists at the top level. We have two components here. If we expand, we can see that the bodies have been transferred over to each component. Looking at the timeline, we see a component creation step. At this point, in order to better identify the components, let's toggle on component color cycling by going to inspect. The default colors are not always the best. You can right click on each component to cycle through the colors. You can do this for the top level too. The color strip in the browser for each component corresponds to the color of the component in the model space. The top level is currently active. In the timeline, you can see the steps that were taken leading up to the component creation. Since these are all actions taken at the top level, they have been grouped together with the same color strip as the top level. Now it's time to add details that are unique to each housing. Let's label these housings. To change housing A, we need to activate it. Once you activate, the inactive component turns translucent. Looking at the timeline, the top level features have been hidden, with the exception of the component creation step, which is labeled with the same color strip as the top level. We shall add a text sketch and extrude. After that is done, you can see that the sketch and the extrude have been added as steps in the timeline. These have been labeled with the same colors as the component. Let's activate the top level and observe what happens to the timeline. We can see actions taken at the top level. We can also see actions taken at the components level. So activating the top level gives you a universal view of all features. So let's repeat the labeling process for housing B. 
the correct way would be to activate housing B and create a sketch and extrude. Suppose that you forget to do that and start a sketch while the top level is active. So let's try that and see what happens. Select the face of housing B and start sketching. When you confirm a sketch, notice that the sketch has been labeled the same color as the top level. The sketch now exists in the sketch folder of the top level. Let's go ahead and perform an extruder cut anyway. I'm going to drag the arrow down to perform a cut. Before I do that, pay close attention to the top level and housing B in the browser. You can see that the extrude command has intelligently activated housing B to perform this cut. This is a temporary activation. Once we confirm the feature, we are back to having the top level active again. You can see that this time, the extrude has been labeled the same color as the component. So we have the sketch and the corresponding extrude residing at a different hierarchy in the browser. This is not ideal. So you want to be careful to make sure that you activate the relevant component every time you need to add a feature unique to that component. So I'm going to repeat this in a proper fashion and fast forward to the next step. Alright, so now we have the sketch and the extrude both in housing B. Next, let's create a lip on housing A. Activate housing A. Let's hide housing B. Create a sketch on a plane above the open face. Project the external edges and create an offset. This will form the profile of the lip. Begin the extrude command. We need this lip to follow the existing open face. Go to start and choose object. We will select this face as a starting face. Unhide housing B and activate the top level. Just to recap, these are the text extrude features for housing A, these are the text extrude features for housing B, and these are the lip features for housing A. The top level timeline strictly follows the order of the features in which they have been created. It does not attempt to arrange them in terms of components. You can always isolate features for each component by activating them. For the last step, we need to create a groove on housing B to accommodate the lip. We will use the lip on housing A to cut into housing B. Activate housing B. Go to modify, combine. Select housing B as the target and housing A as the tool body. For operation, set to cut. We want to keep housing A after this. So check on the Keep Tools option. Let's confirm. A combined step has been added to housing B. Let's activate the top level. You can see that housing A does not contain a combined step, even though it was involved in that step. Only the target body, which is housing B in this case, would have a step recorded. The main benefits of this workflow will be apparent when it comes to making changes. We need to identify two types of changes, master model level or components level. If we need to make a change to the overall size of the box for instance, there will be a change on the master model. So straight away, you should only focus on the segment of the timeline that deals with the master model. Locate the sketch, and make that change. The change will propagate itself down to the components. We can even shift the split line. And everything down to the lip and groove feature would regenerate accordingly.
If you need to add details unique to each component, activate the relevant component and you will see only the features relevant to that component. This allows you to work on a component without having a cluttered timeline. So the master model workflow facilitates changes at the universal level and also plays a part in better model management. So I hope that you have found this useful. Do keep a lookout for the next master model video.